Welcome everyone to Have History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and the patrons over on Patreon voted for the fight for Henry Hill during the first Battle of Manassas to be animated into a battle map. Since today, July 21st, is the anniversary of the first Battle of Bull Run, I can think of no better way to remember that historic occasion than by covering it here. If you want to vote for the animated battle maps, the link is in the description below for the Patreon page, and that is where you can join for as little as $1 and get to cast your ballot. Thank you all for the support. By July 1861, the young Confederate nation had formed its armies and prepared for its defense. The first major clash between the armies of the United States and the Confederate States came in Northern Virginia along the Bull Run Creek and a railroad junction named Manassas, about 30 miles from Washington, D.C. The Southern armies of Joseph E. Johnston and P.G.T. Beauregard combined at the junction to combat the Union Army under Irvin McDowell. The two major actions took place at the fords along the Bull Run Creek and on two hills to the northwest, Matthews Hill and Henry Hill. After being driven off Matthews Hill, the Southerners fell back in disorder to Henry Hill. Only two regiments were organized enough to put up a defense, the 4th Alabama who occupied the junction of the Warrington Pike and the Manassas Sudley Road, and the 7th Georgia who guarded the Warrenton Pike just east of the Alabamians. The two units were backed up by artillery under John M. Bowden. Reinforcements in the form of Hampton's Legion and Brigadier General Thomas Jonathan Jackson's brigade were on their way to help the Confederate position on Henry Hill. After winning victory on Matthews Hill, Burnside's brigade pulled back and did not pursue the retreating rebels. However, Porter's brigade under Averill did continue to chase after them. However, instead of deploying the entire brigade against Henry Hill, Averill sent only the 27th New York, who quickly pushed back the Alabamians as Hampton's Legion strengthened the 7th Georgia's right flank. The troops of the 4th scrambled behind Imboden's artillery, who let out a destructive fire on the New Yorkers who veered down the Warrington Pike towards Hampton's men. The 7th Georgia was able to march within shouting distance of the 27th because both armies had various colored uniforms and the men from New York thought the Georgians were fellow Federals. Averill ordered the 8th New York and the 14th Brooklyn to back up the 27th. A deadly fire between the two sides ensued until both sides fell back to a safe distance. The 8th New York was so battered that they would not engage further in the battle. Hampton and the 7th Georgia had stalled the Union advance for about an hour. This presented plenty of time for Brigadier General Jackson to deploy his Virginians on Henry Hill. And Bowden, who had nearly expelled all his ammunition, told Jackson he only had three shots left and would fall back. Jackson told him to stay on Henry Hill because he needed to demonstrate strength, which might discourage the Union from attacking long enough for his men to be deployed. So Imboden held firm with three rounds of ammunition for his four guns. About noon, both Generals Johnston and Beauregard rode onto the scene with additional artillery, allowing Imboden to fall back. General Key's brigade crossed Bull Run and prepared to attack Henry Hill in a piecemeal fashion. Keyes, not willing to wait for the 1st and 2nd Connecticut to form up, ordered the 3rd Connecticut and the 2nd Maine to attack Jackson's brigade. The force of the attack stunned the 5th Virginia and Hampton's Legion, who fell back about 100 yards, but the Virginians were not defeated. They launched a counter-assault, which devastated the two Federal regiments and the Federals retreated to the east. Fearing his flanks could be turned, he asked Jeb Stewart to split his 300-man cavalry force in half and placed them on the wings. The Union followed up their attack with another one by the Marines, the 11th New York, and 1st Minnesota, who supported Ricketts' artillery up Henry Hill to attack Jackson's left flank. Confederate sharpshooters hidden in the Henry House took shots at the Union artillery. The leftmost gun fired into the house in the rebels scrambling, but Judith Henry, an 85-year-old woman who was in the house, would be wounded and die before nightfall. Griffin's battery joined Ricketts, but the Federal artillery was on the slope where they were unable to see the enemy and their long-range shells did little damage to the Confederates who were too near to their position. The Minnesotans and the 11th New York came into contact with the 33rd Virginia who delivered a devastating fire into the Yankees. The Union troops began to flee, but seeing their dismay, Jeb Stewart's cavalry chased after them only adding to the confusion of the rout. Both sides began to get reinforcements Ricketts' battery had lost so many horses to artillery and small arms fire that it could not retreat. Griffin, in an audacious move, 
sent two of his guns to Ricketts Wright to shell the 33rd Virginia. Colonel Cummings of the 33rd knew his regiment could not withstand artillery fire from point blank range, so he ordered his men to charge. McDowell's chief of artillery rode up to the two guns and told them not to fire that the men they were going to shoot were Federals. The commander argued with him, but by the time the chief of artillery realized it was enemy troops, it was too late, and the guns had to be abandoned to the Virginians, who rushed in and took possession. It was about 3 p.m. when General Bernard B. saw the 4th Alabama milling about, and yelled his now famous words to them, saying, There stands Jackson like a stone wall. Rally behind the Virginians. Which the Alabamians did. The 14th Brooklyn launched an attack on the 33rd Virginia to get Griffin's guns back. The charge was so organized and deadly that the Virginians fell back, exposing the 2nd Virginia to musketry. The commander of the 2nd attempted to refuse a few companies to the left, but in a panic, his men bolted for the rear with the 33rd. Now the New Yorkers turned their attention to the prone Confederate artillery. Their small arms fire ripped into the artillerymen and threatened to turn Jackson's entire line. However, they did not see the Confederate reinforcements forming up on the reverse slope of Henry Hill. Jackson calmly ordered the 4th and the 27th Virginia to face the enemy and then called out, reserve your fire until they come within 50 yards, then fire and give them the bayonet. And when you charge, yell like furies. The Virginians did as they were told, delivering a withering fire into the men from Brooklyn and then charging their ranks, sending them back across the Manassas Sudley Road. The 6th North Carolina on the left saw a handful of men from the 14th Brooklyn defending Griffin's guns and charged them, capturing the pieces, but deadly volleys from the Union soldiers concealed in the woods beyond the road forced the North Carolinans back with nothing to show for their effort. The 4th and 27th Virginia, after defeating the 14th Brooklyn, attacked Ricketts Battery, who had lost so many horses that they could not pull their guns to safety. However, Griffin's three guns on the left of the Union line limbered up their pieces and proceeded down the slope. The Virginians now held the position around the house. The 1st Michigan was ordered to retake the lost batteries and went into hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Virginians, but could not drive off the rebels, and that forced them to withdraw. To the south, a conglomeration of the 1st Minnesota, 11th New York, and 14th Brooklyn attempted to take back Griffin's guns still left, but a combination of artillery and small arms fire from the Confederates holding Henry Hill forced them back. Jackson's men would not hold the cannons long because the 11th and 5th Massachusetts would attack and drive the Virginians away. However, about that same time, General Beauregard, seeing that the position needed to be held, gathered Hampton's Legion and the 5th Virginia and personally led them to retake the artillery pieces. By this point, Jackson's regiments and troops were in a jumbled, disorganized mess. He pulled them back in order to bring order to the ranks. By this point, Colonel Nathan Evans had reformed some of his brigade since being driven from Matthews Hill. The fight over Griffin's guns just east of the Manassas Sudley Road was not over. A conglomeration of troops on both sides descended on the artillery pieces, but ultimately the Confederates won the prize. But Brigadier General Bernard B. would be shot in the abdomen in the charge and die the next day. This action by the Southern soldiers provided an opportunity for the Southern artillery to pull back a safe distance out of the fighting and also to refill their caissons. Colonel William T. Sherman and his brigade were about to launch their assaults on Henry Hill. Instead of ordering his men to attack in a concentrated effort, Sherman sent his regiments in piecemeal, sending the 13th New York in first. As the Yankee troops marched up the hill and fired on Hampton's men, voices through the smoke yelled out that they were firing on friends. This was a ruse by Hampton's men, but the fact that both sides wore variations of gray and blue only confused the situation. After Hampton's men fired back, the ruse was found out, and both sides fired volleys into one another. Next, the 2nd Wisconsin moved up to confront the 5th Virginia, who applied the same ruse as Hampton, yelling that they were friendly. When the Virginians leveled their muskets and fired, the men from Wisconsin descended the hill where the gray uniforms made them look like rebels to their fellow Union soldiers. A deadly crossfire resulted until the officers of the 2nd Wisconsin could alert their comrades to stop firing on them. Sherman then ordered his 3rd Regiment, the 79th New York, to attack the enemy. The ruse was once again performed, causing confusion and panic when the perceived Union troops fired on them. Like the other units in their brigade, the 79th New York descended the hill in defeat. 
McDowell's presence on the field instilled courage in his men, and he helped organize another attack. The 69th New York, Sherman's last regiment, and the 38th New York prepared to attack Henry Hill, while the conglomeration of Union troops to the south prepared to retake Griffin's two guns. The attack succeeded in driving off the rebels. Henry Hill was finally in Union hands, but the battered federal troops did not expect the fresh reinforcements driving towards them from Philip St. George Cox Brigade from the east and Millage Bonham's brigade from the south. The fresh rebel units rushed Henry Hill and sent the Union troops into a retreat. To the west of the Manassas Sudley Road, a lone Union brigade under Oliver Otis Howard attempted to attack Chin Ridge, but was repulsed by two Confederate brigades. This ended the fight for Henry Hill. By the end of the battle, the Confederate casualties totaled 1,982, with 387 killed, 1,582 wounded, 13 missing and or captured. The Union casualties totaled 2,896, with 460 killed, 1,124 wounded, and 1,312 missing and or captured. This battle would stun both nations as to the amount of casualties, illustrate the need for more ambulances and surgeons, provide a military foundation for the Confederacy to live, and give the new nation a hero to look up to in the iconic Thomas Stonewall Jackson. Thank you all so much for watching and supporting the channel. Please consider subscribing if you haven't done so, and check out all of my videos to get a deep dive into history's most significant events and some that you may have never heard of.